Okay, so today we're going to be talking about aluminum. <clears throat> now, aluminum is a material that you're very familiar with. You, you've all played with aluminum foil all your life, right? And the properties of aluminum are interesting, right? They're, it's a relatively soft material. Uh, it's very durable. It's very lightweight. Um, and it's very ductile. Uh, its appearance is very shiny. And so that actually has some advantages as a reflector. Um, and its yield strength is actually very low. Uh, only about 7 to 11 megapascals, which is far, far below something like steel, which is up to 200 to 500 megapascals. So, so why in the world would aluminum ever find any value as a, as a metal that we could use in industry? Uh, and we're going to talk more about that as we get into it. Uh, it's also very corrosion resistant, except in salt water. Um, <clears throat> and it's inherently difficult to weld unless you actually put it under an inert gas. And that also is a property of uh, of, the, of the aluminum because it forms a very stable oxide. So, question is, why is aluminum so useful? Well, number one, aluminum is extremely common. So it's the most common metal in the Earth's crust. It's only behind silicon and oxygen in its prevalence. So there's a lot of aluminum around, which makes it, which raises that really interesting question. Why wasn't it discovered earlier? In other words, if you look at aluminum, uh, you would think that if something as common as aluminum, it would have been used 3,000 years ago. The challenge with aluminum is that it forms an extremely stable oxide. It forms an aluminum oxide, Al2O3, on the surface. And it turns out that you cannot reduce aluminum oxide using charcoal or carbon monoxide. And that has been the medium in which we've used, the reducing agent we used for the copper and for the iron, et cetera. And so, uh, so they really didn't know that aluminum was a metal for a long time. Now, if you want to understand how they finally discovered aluminum, you basically have to go back to the idea that alchemy started several thousand years ago with the idea of turning some form of metal, lead or whatever, into gold. By the 1600s and 1700s, they realized that this was pretty futile and they weren't getting anywhere. And so they basically started studying how things burn and chemistry of things. And so when the early studies of burning, they blamed the way something burns on phlogiston, which is a fiery substance that they said materials possess. And this phlogiston was given off when you started to burn something. And it left behind a calx, which we would call an ash. And so the phlogiston model was accepted as the way in which materials burned or oxidized. They didn't know it was oxidizing, they just call it burning. Priestley was studying mercury oxide, which he hit with sunlight, and it gave off a gas. And he didn't know what that gas was, but he did stick an, a candle flame under it and noticed that the candle burned much brighter in that gas. In 1771, Antoine Lavoisier in France was very interested in Priestley's works and he was studying this to try to understand what was going on. Now, Lavoisier was a very careful chemist and he had some very nice balances. And so he took metal and he started to weigh the metal before and after he heated it in air. And so as the metal burned or corroded and became an oxide, he measured the weight of it and he noticed that the weight actually went up. And so everybody said, well, it can't go up. It's supposed to be giving off phlogiston. And so then they assigned a negative weight to phlogiston, which makes absolutely no sense. Um, so Lavoisier repeated his experiments with mercury oxide that had been done by Priestley. And he was able to prove that the gas that was coming off was also the same gas that was being added to metals when, it, when they rusted. And he called this oxygen. All right. And this oxygen basically laid to rest the whole theory of phlogiston because, uh, and now we had a, uh, a mechanism by which we understood how metals formed an oxide. Lavoisier was amazing as a scientist because he also subsequently proved that sulfur was actually an element, uh, not a compound. He was the first to organize the elements by weight in the periodic table. Uh, and he was also the first to show that elements may change form, but they didn't change weight, the weight was fixed. 
So he's doing all these amazing things, and in 1794 he was guillotined at the age of 50 because they said he was selling dilute tobacco. This was, of course, part of the French Revolution. I guess the good news is that he was pardoned a year later. But anyway, probably didn't matter much to him. Um, so how does this lead to the discovery of aluminum? Well, now that we understood that oxygen was part of how materials rust, or then, then it was thought, what would happen if we inject forcibly electrons into certain oxides? Could we convert them back to some form of metal? And Volta had created a pile, which is basically the first battery, and Sir Humphrey Davy in 1807 was using this pile to basically try to react electricity through a potassium sulfate sodium hydroxide mixture. So he put this mixture on top of a crucible, a metal plate, and he put another metal plate on top of it. He passed a current through it, and he started to form metallic sodium and potassium droplets. So Hans Ersted in 1825 used these potassium metal droplets and uh, sodium metal droplets to actually reduce aluminum chloride. He took aluminum chloride and he reacted it with it, and now it turned out that the potassium and the sodium wanted the oxygen more than the aluminum and they would take, uh, or the chlorine, and they would take the chlorine off the aluminum and leave aluminum behind. So this was the first discovery of metallic aluminum. Um, and the, it worked very well, but it was a very expensive way of making aluminum. In fact, aluminum was so valuable, it was much more valuable than gold. Uh, Napoleon III actually used aluminum dinnerware for his best guests. Everybody else simply got gold dinnerware. But the good people, the people he wanted to impress, got the aluminum dinnerware. So um, all the way up until about 1886, aluminum was extremely expensive. In fact, it was used to top the Washington Monument with a small pyramid um, because it was so valuable. But in 1886, a gentleman named Charles Hall and another one named Paul Heralt, Hall was in the US, Heralt was in France, independently invented a way of making aluminum very cheaply. So the challenge is, is that if you want to make aluminum from aluminum oxide, what you have to do is somehow melt the aluminum oxide. Um, and aluminum oxide melts at greater than 2,000 degrees C, so it was just very, very hot and very expensive to try to make molten aluminum oxide. And so what these gentlemen did was they discovered a material called cryolite. Cryolite is a sodium aluminum fluoride that has a very low melting point, about 950 degrees C. And that melting point was so low that it, you could actually dissolve, you could melt the cryolite, and then you could dissolve aluminum oxide, which came from bauxite, into the melt. Then you could put your electrodes into it and make aluminum very cheaply. And so in 1856, for example, the cost of aluminum was around $90 a pound, which would have been several thousand dollars a pound today. Um, but by 1890, the price had dropped to less than 30 cents a pound. Um, and so that led to an explosion of aluminum. Worldwide production in 1873, for example, was only two and a half tons. Today, we make more than 40 million tons of aluminum every year. This aluminum consumes an awful lot of electricity. And so the early plants were built basically right next to hydroelectric dams, which made it much cheaper to make the aluminum. Today, it takes about 15 kilowatt hours of electricity to produce a kilogram of aluminum. And that consumes about 5% of the electricity in the US today goes just to making aluminum. So this has some significant greenhouse production uh, issues and challenges. The top producer of aluminum today, in, or in 2011, was Russia followed by Canada and then the United States through Alcoa. So we're back to the question of the property challenge. As I said, aluminum is, now we can make aluminum very cheap. However, its yield strength was only seven to 11 megapascals. It was very, very weak material. So how do you make it strong? So you have three options. What we talked about earlier on with bronze was you did something called solid solution hardening. You would add tin to, the bron to copper and you would create a solid solution of tin and copper and that would strengthen the, the uh, make dislocation motion much more difficult and it would strengthen your copper and, and you create a, a bronze solid solution. 
The other way to do it was to work hard in a material like bronze where you would hit it and forge it and in the process of beating on, on bronze you would make it very hard by making a big tangle of dislocations that couldn't move past each other. Turns out neither of these processes worked very well for aluminum. And so the, the, but the process that does work very well for aluminum is precipitation hardening. So the way precipitation hardening is, is that if you take aluminum and you add something along the lines of about 4% copper or silicon to the aluminum while it's melted and then you quench it, all right, this copper uh, or the silicon is actually super saturated in the aluminum. It's like making um, iced tea with way too much sugar in it. When you cool it down, that sugar is, is still in the solution. Now, if you heat it back up a little bit, what happens is, is that copper starts to precipitate out or the silicon precipitates out, much like you would grow rock candy in a super saturated sugar solution. And that copper and silicon precipitates are very, very effective at blocking the dislocations. And that makes the aluminum extremely hard. And so I can increase the yield strength of aluminum by 100x. This is called age hardening. And that was the critical aspect of this thing. So if you look at the phase diagram, you'll see what we're doing is that uh, in the aluminum copper phase diagram, by adding something more than just a, a few percent of copper, we actually get into a two phase mixture. So when we quench it down from the liquid stage, it's actually gonna wanna form that theta prime precipitate plus aluminum. Or if you take aluminum and silicon, then the same thing happens, and in this phase diagram, you quench it down from the liquid, and now what happens is it wants to form aluminum plus the silicon precipitates. And it's these precipitates that give it its, its high strength and makes it actually very useful. Without that precipitation, you couldn't use it. So where is aluminum used today? Well, it's obviously used in lots and lots of applications. Transportation, automobiles, aircraft, beverage cans, construction, windows, doors, cooking utensils, street lights, et cetera. Your, your laptop casings, um, aluminum foil, as I pointed out here. Uh, very popular material. So it's used extensively in all these applications. Now, if we just focus on one of them, for example, the aircraft application, the real advantage to aluminum is that although it's not as strong as steel, all right, it is much lighter than steel. So when you're dealing with an aircraft application, the specific strength is much more important. And the specific strength is a combination of its strength and its weight. And that's actually 50% higher for aluminum than it is for steel. So you wind up with a material that is extremely applicable for the aerospace industry. Now the problem is, is that aluminum is susceptible to cyclic fatigue. And there's nothing quite so cyclic as taking an aircraft from atmospheric pressure to high altitude and back again. You're continually cycling the fuselage over and over again. And that cycle can lead to failure. And so, uh, it, and it will actually, in cyclic fatigue, you'll get a failure below the yield strength of the material. And in this case, the key is a crack or some sort of a stress razor. So if I have a small crack, and say it's one one thousandth of a millimeter, then it's not a problem. But if that crack cycles back and forth and starts to grow and it gets up to a millimeter, then it can actually accelerate to the point where it will fail catastrophically. And so this was actually the interesting story behind the, uh, the de Havilland airplane. So in, in, the 18, in 1952, there was a British company called de Havilland and they had been making aircraft for a number of years and were one of the leading manufacturers in the world. And they developed a new aircraft called the Comet. And in 1952, they had four crashes over two years. And they tried to figure out what was going on with the crashes. And it turned out that what they had done was when they built these commercial aircraft, they put in rivets and they put the rivets all the way around a square window. Well, if you have a square window, you have a natural stress razor right at the corners of those windows. And so you wound up getting this, when the cyclic fatigue hit, that you get a, a, a propagation of the cracks from those corners, and it caused a catastrophic failure of these aircraft, and they crashed. Um, and so this was a catastrophe for de Havilland. So they spent four years re-engineering this thing, or six years re-engineering, and in 1958, they, they launched the Comet II. However, by that point, Boeing had actually already launched the 707, and they actually then took over the market. And so in 2009, 
the Boeing aircraft actually is accounts for 7.1% of all the exports from the United States. It's the largest single export uh, product from the United States. So unfortunately, those, that square windows cost Great Britain an entire industry. Now, aluminum is extremely reactive. We talked about the fact that I had to force electrons onto this material through electricity to actually get it to become um, an, uh, a metal. So if you take aluminum and you react it with air, it will go back to forming aluminum oxide. Uh, the only reason it doesn't do that instantly with this particular piece of aluminum foil, for example, is because I form a layer of aluminum oxide on the surface that's very, very thin. It's only a few atoms thick. It might be 50 angstroms thick, but it's thin enough that it actually protects the surface of the aluminum from further oxidation. And so because of that, it won't react. However, if you grind it up into very small particles and heat it up with water, for example, you can actually create a very good propellant, and that's the basis behind, for example, the solid rocket fuel uh, booster in the shuttle. Um, so the next question is, well, well, does aluminum ever actually corrode? And the answer is yes. If you put it into a chlorine environment, say around salt water, then what happens is the chlorine will actually penetrate down some of the grain boundaries and it will form a little half cell reaction in there and you'll start to form pits uh, and at the grain boundaries and that pitting is very common. And so if you look at your screen doors over at the beach, you'll often see pits in them from the aluminum corrosion. Um, aluminum also is very reactive. So if you ever put aluminum in contact with another metal, then the aluminum is gonna basically want to steal the oxygen off that metal and so it's gonna actually corrode in favor of protecting that other metal. So you have to be very careful to make sure you don't put this in contact with another metal and you'll have a dissimilar reaction. So in order to understand how aluminum can actually react with, for example, a chlorine environment, uh, we're gonna do a simple demonstration of, of showing you aluminum reacting or corroding with hydrochloric acid. We have aluminum foil and aluminum foil will actually react with hydrochloric acid. And in, in this reaction, what's going to happen is the aluminum is actually going to form aluminum chloride, right? And in doing so, it's going to go from its reduced state to its oxidized state, meaning it has to give up electrons. And the question is, who does it give its electrons up to? And what it does is it gives the electrons off to the hydrogen, and the hydrogen, which is an H+, then forms H2, a gas. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a few little pieces of aluminum foil, and I'll put it in here. All right, and then I'm gonna take some solution, this, this stuff is the works, which is basically a hydrochloric acid solution. All right, I'm gonna take some of that hydrochloric acid, I'm gonna pour it in here. What happens is that hydrochloric acid now is gonna react and it's gonna cause corrosion of the aluminum. So the aluminum is actually, the hydrochloric acid is gonna react with it and the aluminum oxide is gonna break down. It takes a few minutes for that aluminum oxide to break down. And once it does that, the aluminum oxide is then going to start to, uh, is no longer going to prevent the reaction. And you're going to have the aluminum start to form aluminum chloride. So if you watch it a little bit, you'll start to see that it's going to bubble here in a second. And, and that's where it's starting to react and form some of this hydrogen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in here just as a way of keeping it from getting too hot. We'll wait till it gets going. There it goes. And we'll put this in here, and you can see that it's starting to form bubbles. And these bubbles are actually hydrogen. So you can see that every time I light it, those, those hydrogen bubbles are popping. So this is a way of, of actually showing you that aluminum oxide uh, will only protect aluminum for so long and eventually it will uh, corrode and go back to its native state. So we've talked a lot about aluminum and its applications um, and one of the biggest challenges with aluminum is that cost that it, it was to make because it costs so much electricity. And so it turns out it only costs about 5% of the energy to recycle aluminum as it does to form it from its natural product. And so that's why it's probably the most recycled material in the world. Uh, and, and so next time you're drinking out of an aluminum can, 
make sure you recycle it because obviously that's going to help in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions from all this electricity production.